just 50 yards from the levee breach. The Lower Ninth Ward is where the Common Ground volunteers come to help those who have lost everything. We'll visit with the volunteer coordinator for a look into these efforts. Travel television shows viewers the inside track on rating services for restaurants and hotels. We'll sit down with Tim Zagat, founder of Zagat Surveys. What are the latest rules for entering the United States? Travel television talks with Customs and Border Patrol. Members of an Indiana parish travel to the Gulf to help local parishioners rebuild and recover from the hurricane. One hand helping another is part of the Katrina relief story. In Travel Tips, we'll visit a website for the adventurous travel blogger. All of these stories in this episode of Travel Television. And now, on to our first stop. In 1979, the Zagat Guide was established by Tim and Nina Zagat as a guide to New York City restaurants. At the time, it was said that there were over 10,000 restaurants. It would take 10 years to get to them all. Today, Zagat guides review hotels, nightlife, shopping, and golf. While books are still available, neither company delivers the information directly to personal digital assistants. We spoke with Tim Zagat at the WTTC Summit in Washington, D.C. Well, first of all, our company is all about shared experience and content derived from, uh, in this year, 250,000 frequent travelers. And um, we are, you know, I think there's going to be more and more uh, areas of the world that we operate in, more and more people, because, for example, we were able to survey in Japan in Japanese online and it was uh, easy. Uh, it's, when we used to do it on paper, we could never have uh, done that in Japan when we did it all over Japan. Uh, secondly, we were able to survey and will be able to survey in China and in any language that we choose. And that makes a big difference. And there's no data processing bill. Uh, so you can really tap in to the local people in every community and get their experience, which, of course, uh, if you live in a place, you're much more likely to be really knowledgeable about it. It's like having friends wherever you are, and not just a few of them, but uh, we're sort of organizing word of mouth for all of the people who would be interested in traveling to any place in the world. That's our one of our goals. We have uh, now restaurant guides to 75 cities around the world, and we will be expanding in Asia and South America in the next couple of years. Number two, uh, we are worldwide for hotels, resorts, and spas. Um, I think any place that there are large numbers of people who are avid about a particular activity, and they're usually only avid if it's something people enjoy a lot, we eventually will be surveying. We cover movies, music, theater, uh, shopping, entertaining, nightlife, so um, those are all areas which people get a kick out of. Um, we think that with the growth of people traveling, uh, we, we try to target people who are very avid and knowledgeable. And for example, in our travel guides, we have 3,000 travel agents and 27,000 frequent travelers, people who are one night out of 10 in a hotel room. So. What we are trying to do is get people who've already been there or know a lot about it. Now, just think of having 3,000 travel agents to advise you. Most people think they're doing pretty well if they have one travel agent. Secondly, in whatever other subject, for example, when we do uh, food restaurants, we try to go to food and wine societies and target people who are white collar uh, lawyers, accountants, bankers, executives who, by and large, because of the nature of their work, have to eat out day in, day out. So what we try to do is find the people who typify the audience for whatever facility that we are rating and reviewing. We have various uh, products that are on cell phones and PDAs, and it's going to be possible and is possible now as part of our programming uh, for example, to vote on BlackBerry or on other uh, Trio or any number of other uh, products. So you can not only 
uh, go and read up about a restaurant you're going to. But when you get through eating, you can vote on it uh, right, right before you leave the restaurant. That kind of thing is going to be going on more and more in the future. Are you an independent traveler and want to know the inside track of visiting Machu Picchu? Then we have a website for you. Bootsandall.com, formed in 1999, is a free travel membership community for people talking and reading about travel. Boots and All focuses on the out-of-the-way destination, the explorer, and the storyteller. In addition to providing destination information, this site has extensive message boards and blogs where you can share your experiences. While the site has the usual links to reservation sites, its travel guides and world adventure pages are excellent paid places to get up-to-date resources that provide a mixture of insider tips, travel notes, and experiences. Bootsandall.com can be used for help in planning your trip. Through the Traveler's Database, you can connect with people at your destination to check out the best places to visit or inexpensive restaurants. When you return from your trip, Bootsandall.com is a great place to share your experiences. The large database can help you with questions while you are traveling as well. There's no reason to get lost because bootsandall.com will help you find your way. The Work to Rebuild is a community project as members of a church in Indiana talk about their efforts in this episode of Travel Television. Since the devastation of the hurricanes, the Catholic Church has been providing help and creating hope to victims of Hurricane Katrina and Rita in every corner of the Gulf Coast. Catholic Charities is committed to rebuilding better communities, helping families become self-sufficient, and helping victims to overcome their grief and trauma. Church members from throughout the United States travel to the region to lend their help to these efforts. Hi, my name is Richard Segelli. I'm from uh, Dyer, Indiana. I'm here with St. John's Parish, uh, cleaning up the, the the disaster that took place here at Katrina of last year. Out here helping out volunteering work, and it's a pretty shame. It's from seeing it on TV is nothing like seeing it in person, and it's just it's just sad. And um, just breathtaking to see all this damage, and it's just unbelievable. My name is Juan Agosto, and uh, I came down here with a group from St. John Evangelist Church, and we're located in St. John, Indiana. And this just coming here is so, so dramatic to me because you see pictures and you can't understand unless you've been here to see how people have been suffering for the last year or so. And uh, it's something that uh, in my heart I would like to do as much service as I can to help uh, our neighbors in Louisiana, Louisiana, New Orleans. To see volunteer stories, go to www projectkatrinavolunteers.net. Hi, Mark Murphy here on the Festinyog Railway, a railway that was actually constructed to transport slate from the largest slate mine in, in Wales, up in North Wales, all the way to the sea where that slate was then transported throughout the world. In fact, it roofed many parts of the world, including the public library on Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street in New York City. So next time you are in New York, take a look up at that roof and realize that that slate came from Wales. What's uh, another interesting side note with the Vestinia Railway is that uh, in the past on Sundays all of the pubs were closed so locals couldn't get a drink anywhere except on the railway so they'd actually jump on the railway and go for a ride and have a cocktail on a Sunday afternoon. Now we're going to head up to the mine and show you where the slate that was transported on this railway is actually derived from. Hugh, we just arrived at the largest slate mine in North Wales. Um, what are we going to see when we go into the mine itself? Well, when you go into the mine itself, you're going to see the chambers mm -hmm. and the tunnels that the miners dug. And the chambers, that's where the slate was uh, taken out in blocks. 
to be used in the mill outside and uh, really you're going to just see where the men worked in the uh, Victorian era underground. So we're going to go ahead and see what life underground in Wales was like 150 years ago. Well, we've made our way to the tramway that's going to take us directly into the mine and in order to get in there I actually have to climb in and throw on my mining helmet. All right, looks like we're all clear, we're ready to roll. Into the mine we go. We'll see you down there. As you can see, it's a little tight. And it's quite loud. chambers right now where four men actually worked down here. Uh, what were the responsibilities of the various men? Well, the, the two men who worked inside the chamber, it was their job to drill the holes for blasting mm -hmm. to get the slate blocks. Their partners in the mill outside, it was their job to split and dress the slate to, to the required sizes. Now, at what, what age would people actually come down and start learning to work in the mines? They would start between 10 and 12 years of age. 10 to 12. Yeah. And this is about 150 years ago That's here. That's right. And at what point would they stop working in the mines? They'd probably start, stop working between 35 and 40 years of age. Because the dust? Men, yeah, because mostly the dust. But some men did work into the 80s. Wow, into the 80s? Down in the mines. That's incredible. Well, you just got to look into the lifestyle of being a miner in Wales uh, 150 years ago. Uh, talk about a tough living here. Uh, one of the things that you'll find is when you come to visit, you really get to experience it, and the guides are extremely knowledgeable. Uh, one tip as you come up here, especially to this slate mine in North Wales, dress warmly because it's very chilly down there, and you're going to want to stay warm because you can spend up to an hour and a half down below visiting the various chambers here at the largest slate mine in North Wales. Hurricane Katrina created destruction to the United States Gulf Coast that was unimaginable in size and scope. The devastation has uprooted whole communities and over 100,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. Massive flooding in New Orleans because of the failure of the levees flooded neighborhoods and forced people and animals to flee to high ground. It was months before the water receded, and by that time the damage made returning to the homes difficult and dangerous. Water damage destroyed all of the personal property and required that everything that came into contact with the water be removed. This included appliances, flooring, and all interior walls, a process known as house gutting, which is then followed by a treatment of bleach to arrest the spread of mold. The work is hard, expensive, and difficult to accomplish especially if the homeowner has been evacuated to another city. To help the residents begin the process that for many includes accepting the reality that all of their possessions have been destroyed, several organizations have created teams of volunteers who have traveled from around the United States to help begin the process of rebuilding and healing. I'm actually from Chico, California, a long, long way from here. But I just had some time off of work, I had about a month off, nothing to do, so I decided to come out to Louisiana, to New Orleans. I knew they still needed a lot of help out here. So I came down, actually, this is my third day here. And I was originally planning on staying two weeks, but now I think I'm gonna go ahead and extend it out, stay, stay a whole month here. I was gonna go to Mexico after this, but now after seeing everyone helping out over here and all the work that needs to be done, I think this is definitely the spot to be. Surveys and things of that nature. But I told them I was just willing to help out in whatever way possible. And they sent me over here because this is where this is where they need the most help, I guess. So. To see volunteer stories, go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net. I'm speaking with Kelly Clunt, the spokesperson for the Customs and Border Protection Agency. Uh, there are actually, thanks to the U.S. Postal Service and the State Department, there are over 9,000 locations nationwide um, where individuals can apply for a passport. Um, they are $97, they're good for 10 years, um, and they have security features that are really very important. 
um, in our mission in securing the borders. Um, the turnaround time is four to six weeks, and the State Department has really done a phenomenal job. They have um, added about 250 staff to help with the, the very large increase in applications because of this new requirement, mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're sticking to their turnaround time of four to six weeks. So um, travelers can visit travel.state.gov to find out where the closest facility is. Mm -hmm. Um, and also to find out more about international travel in general. Okay. And what, what happens if I should lose my passport? Sure. Uh, the State Department does have, have uh, consular offices abroad where they can assist individuals. Um, and Customs and Border Protection at the ports of entry is used to handling situations and emergency situations of that nature. So we will do everything we can for travelers who, who um, have had passports lost or stolen while on travel. Good. Um, will I be able to continue to use my existing passport that expires in 2014? Absolutely. You will be able to use that passport um, until it expires. Um, one thing that's important is you probably want to um, renew your passport before the actual expiration date. You want to have at least six months. You had mentioned that, that uh, at all airports that uh, there's a, uh, an agent, a, a representative there from the passport office who can help assist people with, uh, with their passports or if they don't, if they've lost it or if they, it has expired? Uh, well, not exactly. Customs and Border Protection is the agency responsible for securing our nation's borders at and in between the ports of entry. Mm -hmm. So for this particular requirement, um, at the international arrivals area, when you clear customs and immigration, Individuals who don't have a passport, uh, we will be giving them more information on the new requirement um, in the form of a tear sheet. We'll actually be handing them information and giving them a copy of a passport application to help them through the process. Great. And what we've seen um, in the in the weeks since we have implemented this is that about 99.99% of travelers um, flying into the U.S have their passports um, or their U.S. permanent resident cards, which are also acceptable. So very high compliance rates. And the compliance, uh, this is with the new passport? That the, These 99.9% .9 have the new passport already? If you've had your passport since 2002 and it's good for 10 years, it may not have, it may not be an e-passport, but it's still valid. Got you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess for any more information, we can always go to the internet and uh, check out your website, right? Absolutely. cbp.gov and travel.state.gov. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. Now there is a site where you can check on the incidence of diseases and health outbreaks around the world. Health Map was created by Clark Fryfed and John Brownstein, who work at Children's Hospital in Boston. It offers a comprehensive review of infectious diseases globally. The site displays a series of Google Maps that are highlighted with red, orange, and yellow markers indicating health alerts. Visitors to the site can view information either by region, country, or by disease. As you scroll the maps, alerts will pop up on the screen. In this instance, we pause at Burkina Faso for an important alert on meningitis. Click on the headline and get all the details. An article from ProMed, a service of the International Society for Infectious Diseases, reveals that 800 people have died from meningitis in Burkina Faso. Website visitors can also use the scroll down section to check the status of specific diseases. Information on the site also covers alerts issued by the World Health Organization. So before you travel, check out healthmap.org. At the foot of the bridge in the Lower Ninth Ward, Common Ground is a ground zero next on Travel Television. It is estimated that throughout the Gulf Coast there are 275,000 housing units that were either damaged or destroyed. In New Orleans Parish, more than 70% of homes are headed by a single parent with half of those earning less than $20,000 annually. To assist those that need help the most and could not afford to move and start over, Common Ground established its storefront at the foot of the bridge next to the levee in the Lower Ninth Ward. 
we meet with the coordinator of that effort. Common ground is a community organization down here in New Orleans that started the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, uh, officially getting started on September 5th, 2005, uh, in the week after the hurricane. We started off as a first aid center in the residents' backyard in the West Bank, across, across the Mississippi River. And in the following months, just more people started to come back to the city there was just sort of a mountain of need as far as social services and other things. So, Common Ground rapidly expanded the services that we provided both in the West Bank and in other parts of the city. And now, a year after the storm, we have multiple locations. Uh, we have many services, including two uh, professional health clinics, a legal clinic, uh, house cutting services sort of throughout the night war. We've got it up upwards of a thousand houses now and we're hoping to do another upwards of several hundred more before the end of the year uh, and then have a spattering of other programs including distribution centers, temporary housing uh, and other things that the community has sort of voiced the need to us to, to help contribute to the area. To see volunteer stories go to www projectkatrinavolunteers.net. Coming up next, bringing hope and help to one family in New Orleans. Well, we came here, what, in 19... Huh? 4th of July, 1970. 1970, we moved in here, which is what, this July will be uh, 38 years that we've been living in this house. We've had a wonderful, wonderful time here I've had plenty of friends in and out. We have many, many good parties. And we hate to see it go, but uh, this is a result of Katrina. No, our, our first impression months. was when we saw on the uh, computer how deep the water was and how high it went, we were concerned that we'd never get back here. And uh, we wound up going to Decatur, Illinois to stay with a brother-in-law so we could work things out. And then from there, we went to Walker, Louisiana for about five months and then finally worked our way back to New Orleans and we're in Kenner right now, renting. Uh, I don't think we could ever move back here. Uh, you know, it would just be too much for us. Um, but if we can, we will, if things work out. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say to uh, JCC for the effort and volunteers? At we could Oxford? never thank them enough. Never. Never thank done. them enough. And all the other volunteers who have come down and helped so many people. We know that there are so many people so much worse off even than we are. Young people who have lost their jobs, which means they're not able to stay in their homes, you know. So a lot of concerns. A lot of progress with Node 2, and we hope the progress continues. Okay. Um, we appreciate so much everything, the organization that they belong to, that does such good work, I'm hearing in a lot of other areas too. So we're deeply grateful to them. To see volunteer stories, go to www.projectkatrinavolunteers.net. All of a sudden, the dining room, pieces of the roof started falling through in there. Living through the trauma of Hurricane Katrina has left many children with scars that surface when they share their stories. I was afraid of if I would see everyone again. It was a really bad hurricane. Here at Camp Noah, kids do more than have a good time. Got me, got me. They also deal with storm stress. They're predicting over 100,000 cases of post-traumatic stress disorder from the children who've been affected. Children who were regressing into things like sucking their thumb, bedwetting, nightmares. Two United Methodist churches on the Gulf Coast are hosting these unique day camps. And you have to go somewhere where it's safer. Well, there's a lot of mental health outlets for adults, but there was none available for children. I bet a lot of your friends um, left and didn't come back. Counselors acknowledge the children's fears and help them face an unpredictable future. I'm kind of afraid that another storm will come. 
I'm gonna have to go through everything all over again.